We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and so it's good to be with you again tonight. If you have a Bible with you, I hope you do in some form or another. I hope you can join me in Acts chapter 20. We'll be in Acts 20 in just a few moments, but I'm glad you're here. I hope to see you all for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And then I hope you can also be present for the Bible class on 2 Peter at 10 o'clock. So that's a good time in between for all of us to get together. And for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account if at all possible. We appreciate that. So you can sign up for one of the two worship services. And please remember, guests are always welcome. So if you're not able to sign up, uh, just feel free to jo join us on Sunday at 9 or 11. And also for the Bible class in between at 10. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts, the book of gospel action written by Luke the beloved physician, and he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, writing primarily about the ministries of Peter and Paul. Peter in the first third of the book, Paul in the last two thirds, and so that is where we are. Uh, tonight we are starting Acts chapter 20, but by way of very brief review, we've been looking at the ABCs of Acts. So we have the ascension in chapter 1, then the beginning of the church. The man who was carried and cured in chapter 3, determined disciples in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. Uh, first deacons, always with a question mark in chapter 6. In chapter 7, we had Stephen, who was the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the Ethiopian officer asking, how can I, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And of course, Philip was there to do the guiding. We're thankful for that. In Acts chapter 9, I am Jesus. That was the Lord's reply to Saul on the road to Damascus. Um, in Acts chapter 10, we had the journey to Joppa with Cornelius sending for men to go get Peter to preach to him. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles. In chapter 12, we have Peter liberated again. In chapter 13, missionaries sent out for the first time. So the first missionary journey. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas on that journey. I had to convince the crowds that they were not gods, but men. In Acts 15, we had the reminder that the old law is not binding. In chapter 16, the Philippian jailer converted along, of course, with Lydia, the, the businesswoman there. In Acts 17, we had questions answered in Athens with Paul preaching on the Areopagus in Athens, Greece. In Acts 18, we had reasoning with a preacher. Just a few weeks ago, we looked at that with Priscilla and Aquila pulling Apollos aside to explain to him the way of God more accurately. In Acts 19, we had saving our religious friends. That's what we've been looking at over the past couple weeks. Paul questions and then baptizes the 12 men in Ephesus who had been baptized improperly the first time. Uh, we had the magicians who were burning their books. So again, they seemed to be religious to some people, certainly, but they uh, realized that was not the way to go. So they converted, and in that process, they burned their books of magic. And then we had the silversmiths and their people. They had that uh, riot in Ephesus, upset that Paul's preaching was going to hurt their bottom line. Well, tonight we move into Acts chapter 20. And the summary of Acts 20 is Troas on the Lord's Day. So Acts chapter 20, the 20th letter of the alphabet being T, Troas on the Lord's Day. Uh, by way of review, we're on Paul's third missionary journey. Paul is now in the process of leaving Ephesus. So Ephesus being right there in the middle of this screen, and then we zoom in on it a little bit here. And in tonight's section, he leaves Ephesus, and then he makes a fairly quick loop through Greece. I think if we put the timeline together, it's a grand total of around a year, um, maybe not even that. Probably that's for the whole journey. So about three months total, maybe in Greece. And then he makes his way back to Troas. So this is kind of the map of where we're going tonight. And if you're following along on the study sheet of the major events in the life of Paul by uh, Dr. Dal Flat, uh, that was uh, available on our website under the Grow tab, like Growing in Your Christian Faith. Under that Grow tab, you can pull down a little another tab for uh, articles. And this, I think, is one of the uh, first articles on that page. So a uh, study guide on the major events in the life of Paul. We're focusing in on a third Roman numeral here on the third missionary journey. Um, hopefully making it clear, the missionary journey, the third one, takes place from 52 to 57 AD. It involves Paul, Titus, and Luke primarily. Uh, Ephesus is one of his main stops, so we have Ephesus underlined right under the uh, kind of the first setback under uh, Roman numeral three. And on this journey, he writes a number of books, First and Second Corinthians, the book of Romans, uh, perhaps the book of Galatians. It's hard to nail down the date on that one. Um, as we move into Acts 20, we're now in 55 AD, so we're right in the middle of his third journey. 
We are heading for 56 AD. We may kind of cross that line tonight. Paul is leaving Ephesus, heading for Macedonia for those three months before he heads back to the city of Troas. So we pick up tonight with Acts 20, verses 1 through 6. So let's look at Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. When he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And he was accompanied by Sopator of Berea, the son of Pyrrhus, and by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and came to them at Troas within five days, and there we stayed seven days. So after the riot in the theater over in Ephesus, that's the uproar that's referred to in verse 1, after the uproar had ceased, uh, Paul gets the disciples together, perhaps they regroup a little bit, what in the world just happened, and they get together to encourage each other, and uh, he exhorted them. And that word for exhort, it's a word that communicates the idea of calling somebody to your side. And I know a lot of us appreciate that when we're having a hard time, somebody comes beside us, puts their arm around our shoulder, and basically says, you can do it, I'm sorry, it's going to be okay, that kind of thing. And so uh, he was exhorting the church, calling them to his side, giving them this word of encouragement or exhortation. And so that's what's going on here. Just kind of hang in there. Uh, this is what Paul does for the disciples in Ephesus. They had just experienced this huge riot. Um, Paul is leaving. He's moving on to the next town. Um, they can't, right? They live there. And so the church that's left behind, they've got to deal with the aftermath of this. Well, Paul just keeps on going uh, to his next stop. And so Paul is encouraging them to hang in there and stay strong. Uh, he leaves for Macedonia. That's what we would consider northern Greece. Uh, passing through Troas, which is kind of on the far upper, like northwest corner of what we would call Turkey today. And uh, heads over from there, going going further west, certainly stops in Philippi. That was one of his supporting congregations. Some other uh, cities in that area, Thessalonica and, and so on, are in that area. And then he heads down to Greece itself. So maybe places like Athens, Corinth would certainly be included here. Uh, by the way, on his first pass through Troas, heading from east to west, he was hoping to meet Titus. And we're not told that here, but we can piece things together. We know from elsewhere that Paul had sent Titus over to Corinth to kind of check on things and to bring back a report. But Titus was not in Troas as Paul expected. Obviously, he couldn't just call him up on the cell phone or send a message or something. And so they had maybe had some plan to meet together in Troas at a certain time or time of year. And Titus wasn't there. And we read about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. This is what Paul says concerning this. Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So I think it's interesting how all this fits together. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13. And so I hope we see how this passage gets inserted right here chronologically. Paul travels from Ephesus to Macedonia hoping to meet Titus along the way in Troas, but Titus is not there for whatever reason. And this is pretty upsetting to Paul, so we can only imagine what's going through his mind. Some terrible thing happened, he's dead, he got distracted, he left the faith, any number of things could have happened. And so, not finding Titus, he is rather dejected, and he keeps on going toward Macedonia. In verse 3, we find that uh, Paul spends three months in Greece, uh, primarily down in Corinth. He finally meets up with Titus down there. We read about this in 2 Corinthians 7, verses 5 through 7. Paul says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. 
So based on the timeline, fitting everything together, he most likely writes the book of 2 Corinthians at this time and kind of sends it on ahead to Corinth with Titus. Uh, this is referred to in 2 Corinthians 8, 6, where Paul says, So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a, be uh, made a beginning, so he would also complete it in you, this gracious work as well. And the context here is that Paul is encouraging a collection for the needy Christians back in Jerusalem. So he's encouraging the church in Corinth to give. And Paul will come along shortly to collect that contribution and to deliver it when he goes back to Jerusalem. So this is a rather quick journey, and he's stopping through, but he sends this message on ahead with Titus saying, uh, get ready, I'm going to come through and collect some money, so you need to do this to get ready for my visit. Uh, Paul then makes his way south into Greece itself. He most likely writes the book of Romans during this time. Uh, as he's traveling in this area, he has what I would describe as Rome on the brain. Um, he really wants to make it to Rome. Back in Acts 19.21, on his way out of Ephesus right after the riot, uh, Paul earlier had said, Now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And so as he's leaving Ephesus, he's, he's thinking of Rome. And that causes him to apparently write a letter to Rome. And we read more about that over in Romans uh, Romans 15, verses 22 through 26, that's where Paul says, For this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you, when I have first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I am going to Jerusalem, serving the saints." For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. All right, again, I know we've looked at a number of verses that get inserted here. This is just a very brief summary here in the first few verses of Acts chapter 20. Um, but we put all of this together, and I, I think it certainly strengthens the case that Paul is collecting funds for famine relief in Jerusalem on this trip. So it's a rather quick trip. Also in verse 3, we have a, a plot by the Jews. Um, this is pretty much a tradition, isn't it? This is uh, the way things have been going on his previous journeys. Uh, Paul comes to preach. He starts in the synagogue. Some of the Jews get angry. Then they do something to run Paul out of town. And then Paul keeps moving. This is just over and over and over and over again. Uh, it seems in this passage that he was planning on sailing, uh, going by sea in a ship of some kind. But due to this plot, he changes those plans at the last minute to traveling by land. That's the reference there to going through Macedonia. And based on the wording there, some have speculated that the plot maybe involved a group of Jews getting on board the boat or the ship, making Paul disappear overboard in the middle of the night along the way or something like that. And so maybe Paul gets wind of this, he hears about it, and so Paul travels by land through Macedonia instead of sailing as he originally planned on doing. It's here in this context that we also have a list of traveling companions. And to me, after the plot and all this, it almost seems like uh, they almost come across as bodyguards as some kind. Um, you know, there's a plot, and then all of a sudden Paul has this larger group of men traveling around him and with him. And, and to me, it's almost as if Luke identifies some of these men by name in a way that maybe Theophilus, who was reading this letter for the first time, would maybe recognize some of these based on who they're related to. So he points out that Sopator is the son of Pyrrhus. And to me, that's a little bit strange to point out unless Theophilus might have known Pyrrhus in some way. And so maybe that's why Luke um, points that out. Otherwise, why would Luke say that? So there's a chance that uh, Luke is identifying some of these men uh, in a way that uh, Theophilus would recognize. The others are identified simply based on where they're from. And this reminds us once again, Acts is a book of history. This is not a once upon a time in a land far, far away kind of book, but this is a book that is based on actual events that actually happened in actual places. So he's not making these places up. These are uh, places that we can still find on a map even today. We can go and visit these places. Uh, in verse 5, as we have seen a time or two previously, these men leave before Paul leaves, and they go on ahead, almost as if they're preparing the way, uh, maybe setting things up for Paul's arrival, uh, getting people together, making arrangements, renting a place, or, or whatever. 
And the other possibility is that they're carrying a rather large sum of money. And so they split up in case they're robbed, they won't lose everything at once. So that's just a, a possibility here. We know that this is maybe the, uh, the famine relief on its way back to Jerusalem. And so we have a number of men here. Uh, we also know from other passages that Paul let the churches pick men that they thought were trustworthy. So it wasn't, hey, trust me with your money kind of thing. And he's going to get on a boat and take it himself, Paul that is. Uh, but uh, a time or two in other places, he has said, said choose somebody that you trust uh, to send this gift, uh, gift on along with me. In verse 6, we have another we passage. I hope we noticed that as we read through it, uh, indicating that Luke, the author, is on this journey. And so he shifts from they to we. So Luke is writing this as an eyewitness at this point. Up in verses 3 and 4, Luke tells us that he set sail, referring, referring to Paul, that he was accompanied by these other men and so on. Uh, but here in verse 6, we sail from Philippi. So Luke joins in with Paul in Philippi, and then they sail together from Philippi. They come to Troas. And uh, by the way, going this direction, if I uh, understand all of this correctly, it takes five days to get from Philippi over to Troas. But uh, eight years, a number of years earlier, I think eight years earlier in Acts 16, that trip had taken only two days. Um, heading in the other direction. So I know if we could be together tonight, I would ask, you know, why would a trip uh, by sea take much longer one direction as opposed to the other? Well, obviously there are currents, there are headwinds and other delays and so on. Um, travel by sea is certainly not as uh, consistent as travel by land can be, but they make it to Troas in five days and uh, they are in Troas for about a week. So let's continue tonight with Acts 20, verses 7 through 12. Acts 27 through 12. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, Do not be troubled, for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. So this is where we come to Troas on the Lord's Day. Troas on the Lord's Day in the ABCs of Acts. And we have a bit of a timing issue that we need to deal with here. As I understand it, the purpose of coming together with the church on the first day of the week was to break bread. And I hope we see that. When we were gathered together to break bread. So the purpose of their assembly was to break bread. Uh, one of the commentaries also pointed out that it was not Paul who assembled them together. It doesn't say, like it does in Miletus later in this chapter, that Paul called for the elders to come meet him. There's nothing like that. But rather, we were gathered together to break bread. This was something they were already in the habit of doing. And so somebody else called this assembly. It was a like, like a standing order. This is something they were in the habit of doing. And so... Uh, they were breaking bread. That was the, the purpose for their coming together. And I believe that is a reference to the Lord's Supper, that reference up in verse 7. Uh, this was not a fellowship dinner, as we would call it today. This was not a potluck. This was not get together in the park and have fun kind of situation. Um, if the purpose of the gathering was simply to have dinner, uh, they could have done that any day of the week, right? They could have done that on a Monday or a Friday or whatever. Uh, but as it is, they came together on the first day of the week for the purpose of breaking bread. That is, for the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the issue is, if somebody wants to make it an issue, we need to be aware of it because some people do. As we look at the rest of this passage, Paul preaches until midnight. And then after midnight, they break bread they eat, and Paul preaches until daybreak, and then he leaves. So our challenge is that breaking bread sometimes refers to the Lord's Supper, and sometimes it refers to eating a meal. And the challenge is, if the second reference to breaking bread also refers to the Lord's Supper, like the first reference in verse 7, 
then what do we have? We've got these people partaking of the Lord's Supper, not on the first day of the week, but rather early on a Monday morning, which is not when we're to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so in my mind, the most likely scenario is that they assemble on the first day of the week for the purpose of partaking of the Lord's Supper, which they do when they come together. Then Paul preaches until midnight. Then they eat a common meal together after midnight, but before Paul leaves. And that, I think, is the most likely uh, explanation of what goes on here. That's the, the one with the least issues. Another remote possibility, much less likely scenario, at least in my mind, is that they are using Jewish time. That's the other argument that's made here, where the first day of the week would start at sunset the night before on Saturday, and that they partake of the Lord's Supper after midnight. Um, making the second reference to breaking bread, the Lord's Supper, not a common meal. And that they do that, it would actually be early on a Sunday morning. Uh, the problem with that view, I believe, is um, where are we? Well, we're in the city of Troas, and Troas is not Israel. And so it is not working, they are not operating under a Jewish time frame here. And so the people of Troas then are most likely using the Roman system like we do, where the first day of the week would be from midnight to midnight, not from sunset to sunset, as it would be under the Jewish system. So I hope that makes sense. I hope that explains the issue here. It depends whether they're working under Roman or Jewish time. But what do we get out of this passage? One thing we get for sure is that the early church was in the habit of coming together on the first day of every week. And this is obviously a shift away from the Jewish custom of coming together on the Sabbath. So yes, Paul often did go to the synagogues on the Sabbath day, but uh, his primary purpose there in doing that was to preach to the Jews. So you go where the people are. And if you want to meet a group of Jews to explain the Messiah and how Jesus fulfills those prophecies, where do you go? You go to the synagogue. And when do you go to the synagogue? Obviously, you go on the Sabbath day when the people are there. So a number of times in Scripture, we have Paul going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Uh, but again, his primary purpose in doing that was to reach the Jewish people. Christians, though, were in the habit of meeting on the first day of the week. So we see it here. We also see it in the reference in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, where Paul basically um, got them to give on the first day of the week. And so the first day of the week then is when the early Christians got together to partake of the Lord's Supper for the purpose of pooling their resources and for the purpose of hearing the word of God preached. And we see that um, here in Acts chapter 20. So the question is, why this day instead of the Sabbath? Why the shift from the seventh day to the first day. What is the spiritual significance of the first day of the week? Well, obviously, the most important thing in world history happened on the first day of the week, didn't it? That's the day Jesus was raised from the dead. So it is resurrection day, the first day of the week. We come together to remember the resurrection of Jesus and to celebrate that. That's why we come together today on the first day of the week. But even beyond this, and really because of this, it seems that the early Christians were in the habit of meeting on the first day of every week. So this was their tradition. It was an inspired tradition. This was their practice. This is the example that they set for us. So on the day of the resurrection itself, beyond just the fact that Jesus was raised, we find Jesus meeting with his disciples as a group later that night, don't we? Over in the book of John, also, he did the same thing exactly a week later on the following Sunday, over in Acts chapter 20, verse 26. Then seven weeks later, the church was established on the first day of the week on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Later in the New Testament, they give on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And here we find they came together for the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. So it's Resurrection Day. It's the day that Jesus met with his disciples after his resurrection for two successive weeks. It's the day they give. It's the day they partake of the Lord's Supper. So all of these things together uh, reinforce our custom of meeting on the first day of the week instead of on Saturday. Uh, while we're still on verse 7, I should also point out that Paul prolonged his message until midnight. Um, some preachers have said, well, look at that. Paul preached a long sermon, and so should I. 
<laughs> this gives this gives preachers permission to preach for as long as they want to preach. I would also point out though that we really don't know when Paul started doing. And whenever I read an article that makes that point, I always think, how do we know he didn't start at 11.45 p.m.? Anyway, that comes to my mind whenever I read this. Um, so if a preacher justifies a 12-hour long sermon by appealing to Paul in Troas, remind him that we don't know exactly when Paul started that sermon. We just know that he preached um, through through the midnight hour. In verses 8 through 10, we have a rather famous account of Eutychus, a young man falling asleep in church. Um, as we look at these verses, let's remember this account is written by a physician. And let's also remember that this is a we passage. So Luke is not only writing this based on research, he's not just confirming things based on eyewitnesses, he himself is an eyewitness. So there was a doctor in the house. Let's just keep that in mind as we look at this. Um, so in verse 7, Luke says, when we assembled together. So Luke is in the assembly. And in verse 8, Luke um, does tell us that there were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together. So what does that tell us? Well, I think it's a reminder that this might not have just been a case of a young man being bored by Paul's preaching. That is maybe a case some have made, but I, I think uh, a more important point may be made here by Luke pointing out that there were many lamps in this place. So uh, let's not go uh, railing on the young man getting mad at him for falling in sleep, uh, falling asleep in church. I think um, I think all of us, especially preachers, are, are glad that uh, glad that everybody's there. And I know everybody's had a hard week, and if somebody um, falls out a window, well, today that'd be kind of bad without the miraculous power, but. Um, you know, falling asleep in church is not the worst thing that's ever happened. I'm just glad you're there, I guess would be one way of putting that. But I think Luke, as a medical doctor, probably mentions that there were many lamps there uh, for a reason. If I'm in a relatively small room with many lamps, there's a chance I might get overwhelmed by the fumes. And so we may have more of a, a carbon monoxide issue going on here uh, than we do a sleepy young man. Um, the other issue is that the young man is sitting on the windowsill. So maybe a practical lesson from this passage, uh, be careful if you're sitting on a windowsill in church. And um, I didn't really realize, or I guess I had forgotten that this was a third story window. In my mind, this was the second story. So I'm thinking 10, maybe 15 feet, but third story window, that is, uh, that is up there. So uh, this guy was way up there and uh, could not have been a huge room with it being on the third floor, at least at, uh, at that time and place. And so, um, I guess, be careful about the window sills. Another good thing we can say about this young man, even, even as a young man, he was with the church, wasn't he? On the first day of the week, he was there. And because he was there on the first day of the week, he was able to meet the Apostle Paul. And how awesome is that? That's a great thing. Uh, but as Paul keeps on talking, I guess we should point out, Luke does seem to emphasize that, doesn't he? As, uh, as he continues, as he kept on talking. So there, there is something maybe to the length story there. Uh, just not as bad as some people might make it. But uh, this young man falls into a deep sleep. So not just, he didn't just fall asleep and fall out. This is a deep sleep. Luke mentions that as a doctor. He falls down from the third floor and he dies. Uh, some have suggested that he wasn't dead, that he just passed out. But again, remember, who's writing this account? This comes from Luke, a medical doctor. So in Luke's professional medical opinion, the young man is dead. And this is certainly uh, one of the most dramatic sermon interruptions of all time, isn't it? So Paul stops preaching. He comes down. He falls upon him, embraces him, and the young man comes back to life. And I know looking through the commentary, some have said, ah, there it is. It, it's an early case of CPR. Paul put his body on the kid's body and, and it, you know, it was compressions. And that, that's how he kind of jump-started the kid. Okay, I wouldn't get too <laughs> bent out of shape over that. But I, I do think it's interesting that we have two other very similar examples in the Bible from the lives of both Elijah and Elisha. 1 Kings 17, 21, and 2 Kings 4, verse 34, where those two prophets stretched themselves out 
over young men who had died, and those young men came back to life. And so to me, it certainly seems as if Paul is following their example here. And I think there's a reason why Luke points that out. But the good news is, the young man was dead, and now he is not dead, but alive. In the last two verses, we get back to the second reference to the breaking of bread. Again, as I understand it, this is what we might describe as something of a fellowship meal, a get-together, potluck. They were eating, uh, not to remember the Lord in this situation, but for nourishment. This is something that they needed. Uh, Paul then keeps talking until daybreak, and he leaves. And we have the reminder again in verse 12 that the boy is alive, and they are greatly comforted by that. Another reminder that he really was dead. It wasn't just uh, that he was asleep or injured or something like that. That was not the case at all. He was dead. And this brings us to the end of Paul's time in Troas on the Lord's Day. So I hope if you're ever needing to remember where this is, you, you somehow tie Troas to Eutychus, and then you got the T, and that's the 20th letter in the alphabet, and you can look back and you can find it in Acts chapter 20. Does that make sense? I, I use that all the time today, even today. Uh, let's conclude tonight with Acts 20, verses 13 through 16. Acts 20, 13 through 16. But we, going ahead to the ship, set sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul on board, for so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. Sailing from there, we arrived the following day at Chios, and the next day we crossed over to Samos, and the day following we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So Paul separates from the group a little bit, maybe to save some time to himself, uh, maybe to meet somebody along the way, we don't know. <laughs> I think this is the second time he's done this. Maybe he's not too fond of sailing. Um, I'm seasick, who knows? But they make their way from uh, Troas to various cities and islands along the western coast of modern-day Turkey and eventually land in Miletus, which is a city on the shore uh, not too far from Ephesus, just a bit more than 30 miles on foot. Paul seems to be in a hurry, doesn't he? That's what Luke says. He's in a hurry on this trip. So he wants to be back in Jerusalem in time for Pentecost, but he's visiting these places along the way. This is a good place for us to take a break tonight. So Paul is making his way back to Jerusalem. He's in a hurry. He's delivering famine relief. He's encouraging some disciples along the way. And some of these disciples he encouraged were in Troas. Troas on the Lord's Day. Uh, next week from Miletus, we will see that Paul sends for the elders from the church in Ephesus. So sends a messenger, says, hey, come down here, let's meet. And they get together on the beach and Paul has his um, encouraging words that he delivers to the elders from Ephesus there on the beach in Milet. It's a very touching uh, section. We don't have time to get into that tonight, so we're going to save his lesson for the elders um, from Ephesus for uh, next week, if the Lord wills. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can be present for worship this Sunday at 9 and 11, and join us for class in between at 10. I'm looking forward to studying Second Peter. John has been doing a great job leading us through that uh, amazing book. And uh, let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. We have a lot of prayer concerns uh, in the congregations and people facing some serious health challenges. Uh, testing is ongoing. Plans of care are being arranged. A uh, lot on people's minds this week. So let's... Uh, Look through the bulletin again, and if you have any updates to that, please send me an email or give a call or send a text, and I would love to get those things updated. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for telling us about the Apostle Paul and his travels. Tonight we're thankful to have learned about his time in Troas, and we're thankful for the young man Eutychus who took the time to be with your people for worship that day. What a great example he is. We're thankful for Luke and for his testimony about the young man's death and resurrection. And we look at this account and we realize that you are, in fact, the God of life. We praise you for that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for being with us through a difficult time. Our nation has been through a time of sickness and death for the past year and a half. We've asked you for help from the very beginning, and you've been merciful as those prayers have been answered along the way over and over again. We pray that you would continue to be with us and that you would continue giving us opportunities to serve as your people. In Jesus we pray. Amen.